So today, it is um, a wonderful topic, isn't it? Even though many of you have heard about this um, word, dukkha, for many years, and maybe you have done retreat and have heard different teachers talking about this concept, dukkha. So um, it's also, just for you to know, it's actually chose this title when I had to write it down on the on the list so it's quite it's more my favorite than the last one we had about how you know I'm falling in love all the time should I abandon the spiritual life so this one is just about straight dukkha suffering a word that the westerners have really had a hard time to translate um it means so many things, and it goes so far beyond just the word suffering as it has been known for decades and decades in translation, lost in translation, as suffering. But actually, for me, I have my personal definition on it. <laughs> it's a texture of the mind sitting on ignorance. It's a wide topic. So it's, um, and many, um, many of us have actually uh, be became interested in the practice of Buddhism. Some people have been born in Buddhist countries, but not necessarily practice before they, maybe they came across this uh, Four Noble Truths and Dukkha being the central part of this Four Noble Truths the Four Noble Truths are sort of expounded as um, there is dukkha, there is a cause of dukkha, there is the ending of dukkha, and there is a path leading to the complete freedom from dukkha. So dukkha has um, just, it's interesting, when you remember, when I remember it when I was young, and not at all interested in any spiritual practice particularly, I, what really brought me to the Buddhist teaching is still this realization that no matter how much I got things I liked, I was still not happy. So that was a real kind of, a, you know, a, a, an incredible news for me. When I get what I want, I'm still not happy. That was the end of the road, really. Where do I go from there? So, life is really compassionate. I tend to, you know, if you open to it. And what I discovered is suddenly a, a, a teacher called Achen Sumedo came to visit the place where I was staying, the university where I was in the north of England with my ex-husband. And even though my interest in meditation didn't grow, particularly during that that visit what I began to see is that my mind was really reflecting a lot more, had suddenly tapped into this more reflective capacity, which uh, I probably had before, but I didn't really knew it. You know, the ability to see something with a certain degree of, with a certain distance, with a certain detachment, you could say. So it's more like the mind suddenly create the space to see more clearly what life is about. And life, as most of us who have practiced long enough, we already know that our world, our life, has a beginning, has a source. Even though we keep looking outside to find the source of our life and problems and difficulties and dukkha, there is one aspect, which is our reactivity to life, which creates a lot of, that creates a lot of suffering, and another part, which begin just by being alive and a human being. We are born into a realm which is fraught with dukkha. It's a mixed bag, really. It's got lots potential for great joy, potential for great happiness, and, of course, as we all know, uh, a terrific potential for being very hurtful. A world can be very hurtful 
by the fact that we grow old and we don't want to grow old. We get sick and we don't want to get sick. We lose our best friend, we lose our partner, our cats, dogs, things we love and beyond our control, they just move away from us sometimes for what seems forever when people pass away. So, you know, when we speak about dukkha in Buddhism, it's really the, um, you could say, the description of the realm of humans. In the realm of humans, it's, it has, it's known for being one of the best place in terms of rebirth because we have enough happiness and sukha to be able to endure the dukkha. If we were just kind of swamped under the suffering of human existence, we probably would not survive. We would die because the body couldn't take it. Mind couldn't take it. But at least there is a kind of balance between uh, a certain degree of satisfaction and dissatisfaction. So many of people who come to the monastery, when I listen to them, it's almost without feeling something unpleasant. Uh, some, Sometimes it's very painful. It's tragic occasionally, you know, and people just come and are very lost as to how to respond to the suffering of their lives. You know, so it's quite touching for me when I see people actually I feel very positive when they come and ask me what to do because I know there is a path that leads you out of suffering. And it might not be uh, an immediate recognition, an immediate you know, realization of this truth, but truly there is a path that ends our human suffering. It doesn't mean that it ends the, the suffering that goes on outside of ourselves, a suffering for which we have very little control. We can't control life for very long, have you noticed that? And if you try to control it for too long, you get sick, or other people get ill because of your controlling habits. But whichever way it is, when we control, try to control things in a way that is unskillful, selfish, and um, egotistic, then the result is, um, you know, is, is the same. It's very um, negative and it doesn't lead anywhere except to more further, deeper misery. And there is such a, such a mountain of situation in our lives that can um, be, the, you could say, the creator of our human miseries without even looking at all the terrible thing that goes on in the world at the moment, which is so confusing and so mind-boggling for most people because we have no control over it. And then the Buddha says, well, you know, if you really want to, con to have some effect on the world, just begin with yourself because the world is made up of how many billions of people who create the world themselves. So the result, what we see in the world, is a result of a human, human minds that have not been particularly free and liberated from suffering. This is a result. The Buddha pointed out, anger is painful, pointed out. Pain is, um, you know, is a natural result of an angry mind. Selfishness worry, anxiety, dissatisfaction, resentment, fear, all these states of mind which course through ours are painful. And for a long, long time, we have distracted ourselves from the truth that the Buddha expounds. We may be very good and very attracted to that which is clever in the Buddhist teaching. Read tons of books on the Paticca Samuppada, the law of dependent origination, the nature of existence. Does the world exist or does it not exist? Is the soul and the body the same? Is the body and the soul not the same? Is the world infinite or finite? And so on. All these questions were asked during the time of the Buddha. But he refused to respond to many of them 
why, people said, why don't you say anything to the question we ask you? He said, because they do not need to the goal. And the goal, the Buddha explains, is the end of suffering, the end of pain. Whatever, you know, the Buddha was approached by so, you know, so many people from so many um, course of life, from so many backgrounds, you know, highly educated people, poor people, uneducated, rich kings and queens and so on. And everyone else in the middle, uh, you know, but the, the Buddha never really moved away from the goal. He came into this world to teach what is the goal of the path that he discovered. No matter how clever and how wonderfully uh, sophisticated philosophy were brought to him, he stayed again and again with a goal. And the center, you know, the centerpiece of the goal that the Buddha talks about is a full, are the full noble truth. You know. And those truths Ajahn Sumedho used to uh, you know, tell us with a, a humor that they, in many circles, those truths are considered beginner's Buddhism. Forgetting that actually this is a description of the process of enlightenment of the Buddha. Just a small thing, hmm. a detail, beginner's. <laughs> and I'm so grateful for Lumpo Sumedho to have made his teaching, the central piece of his teaching, the constant returning to the Four Noble Truths because it's so profound and it's something that will never get you in the wrong direction. But of course, one of the things we must learn, you know, is how to handle suffering. Most of us have been brought into this world with no skills. Or if we have skills, they are called more worldly skills. You know, like I said, the first part of this talk was the suffering of the world. And the world in Buddhism is actually the world of ignorance. He doesn't talk about whether we can flatten mountains or empty oceans or change of the world outside the physical world. He doesn't really attend to that particularly, but the world that is um, born into this fathom-long body. He, des he described this, you know, uh, if I can remember this story about somebody come to him and say, the end of the world, the end of the world, what is the end of the world, Lord? And he says, um, well, you don't go to the end of the world by walking. There's no end of the world without the end of suffering. And where is this suffering? The suffering is in this long, you know, this in this body, fathom long body. And that's what the teaching is focused on. How do we how do we deal, how do we attend to this instrument that we have that is connecting us to the world? Do you understand? We we see the world, we hear the world, we taste the world, we touch the world, we think about the world. Right? Might have forgotten one sense, but anyway, you got it, I'm sure. Through the sense doors, don't we? If we didn't have any sense door, we wouldn't have any, the world could not manifest in the same way. Maybe we would, see if we still had a brain to work, we could still think. But the world with, with create is, a fru, is a, the result of how we interpret our sense objects. And of course, you know, what is associated with our sense objects. So maybe we'll talk about karma, we talk about what we remember from the past, we talk about our past experience, maybe from this life or past life, if you believe in that, or, you know, the, la the, the kind of um, large uh, bank account of uh, past actions that might have come with this life, as we were born, we are born with these particular propensities, particular style of 
a particular country, with parents, we have particular bodies, we have our sense faculty maybe diminished or uh, very bright and active. We may be born with sickness, with physical limitations, and so on. So um, all this affects how we create the world. Now, I've met enough people in my life to know that even when people are born with absolutely the best, best conditions that you, you can ever dream of, they still suffer. So if you suffer, don't worry, you're not alone. <laughs> and it's not like a suffering where people you see the whole day, people crying and you know, tearing their hair and so on. It's a much more quieter suffering. It's the ability to see things as they are. Is what is the inability, sorry, to see things as they are, which is a kind of vague word for most people. What does it mean? So just to go back to the, you know, the, the way things are in the world, we are very much caught up with forces. For example, you know, the Buddha talks about the worldly winds, such as love and hate, such as um, you know, success and failure, such as praise and blame, fame and defame, and so on. These winds, as they are called in Buddhism, course through our mind, our citta, our life. The citta is not just a brain. The citta is a mind we experience right now in this moment. It, there is feeling, there is stories, there is sensation, there is this or that. That's called the experience of the citta. It's not just thinking. Yeah? So all of us, when we are born into this world, we are immediately in contact with this worldly wind. You notice when you're born, uh, you know, at by the age of three, your mom and dad want you really to be successful at school, don't you? Don't they? They want you to be the best girl, the best boy. Start sometime earlier, even. When your parents start making you play piano and do bungee ch jumping, you know, at the age of five, and uh, somebody, I'll just say this because I had to laugh when I, it was a comic uh, story. <laughs> somebody talking about bungee jumping meditation. <laughs> Vipassana, whilst you jump. <laughs> but anyway, that's another story. But we are, from the beginning of our life, brought into a world that is very demanding. You know, after that, we failed, and the parents feel really bad about it, and they. Some people are, are worse, they make the, the children bad because they haven't done the right thing, they have failed. And we don't even know, you know, why these, the world is affecting our children, our parents, the way they do. A lot of the time we're just reacting. Reacting to my, our mothers and our fathers, our children. We're not really at peace with the world. That's what is missing. Once you know the world a little better, it doesn't mean that the world is going to change that much. The difference is that your heart may be more at peace, and from that place of peacefulness, you may be able to respond to the world much more wisely and compassionately. That's a big difference. You might not be able to change your parents, I'm sorry for those teenagers, you might not be able to uh, change your little daughter who is keep doing being naughty and cheeky, but your approach to life it might be a peaceful approach. And peace comes, this is the third noble truth, peace comes when we have been able to learn how to let things go, for one thing, and not only that, to actually learn how to be with what happened to the mind when you have let go. And Jan Sumedho again used to say, <laughs> you know, nobody is interested in noticing the moment once they have let go of things. Be getting born into something new, struggling with the suffering, that's all exciting and interesting maybe. 
But what happens when you suddenly drop it, let go, let it seize, let it pass away? Suddenly, you lose interest. You're onto the next treadmill for the next birth. You don't really pay attention to the mind that is released from attachment for even a few seconds. I used to say, this kind of piece is really an acquired taste. Not many people, including myself, I know it very well. How many people want to die to their old world? Not many. You know, how many people want to let move on, let go, move on? Not so many. But one of the main reasons is because we haven't seen yet that this world is painful. To actually, to want to transcend the world at the level of the Four Noble Truths means to really see that suffering is not the way. There must be another way. And also to have faith. To have really confidence that the teaching works. You never know. It's a risk you take. But you easily take this risk when you have seen that the, the alternative is really not that satisfactory. Once you see that, then you have no doubt. You can actually move to the place where you don't know yet, but it's probably much better than what I've been through. So, you know, when we look at these worldly winds, how many of us don't want to be hated and aspire to be loved? How many of us want to be successful in what we're doing and really fear so much uh, being, um, you know, a failing? Most people spend their life sometimes with a horrible sense of failure till they die, till they die, or feeling not good about themselves, or losing confidence, not having confidence in themselves. So this is the suffering of the world. Is, has, it's, it's mega, it's huge. And when we start looking at the details, in contrast, of course, against the, the background of a peaceful mind that we discover in our meditation. So meditation is naturally the other central piece of practice, you know is that unless we have a contrast, it's very difficult to know what we are experiencing. But I know that the time when my mind, I mentioned that to you at the beginning, when I began to see that there was more space in my mind, more detachment to life in some way, to experience a spaciousness which enabled me to feel the mind in a different form. There was a mind that was listening, knowing, and contemplating, contemplative mind, and there was a mind that was worried and anxious and all that, so sort of humdrum habits of the mind. So against that, I personally became very curious by this mind that seemed to be so peaceful against the mind that seems so unpeaceful. That's why I really encourage you to meditate, to do really develop practice, because even though the second part of this talk is about the dukkha of the past, which is the meditation aspect. And of course, also the sila aspect, and of course, the wisdom aspect, you know, sila samadhi panya, the fourth noble truth, which is the, the cure, basically. Your cure from ignorance and suffering. So, <clears throat> you can see when we begin to be more conscious, when, when you know, we are helped to be more conscious of that which we encounter every day in our daily life, every day. We're frightened to die, we're frightened to get sick, we're frightened to lose our dear ones, we're frightened to fail, we're fr you know, and fear itself is, is, a, is a great, you know, we're frightened of fear, aren't we? That's one of my insights. When I stopped being frightened of fear, my fear continued, but I was fine. I didn't suffer. Do you understand? That's what I mean. Once you, once you see that you are attached to something, like my, my experience was when I worked with fear, I, had, I experienced a lot of fear in meditation. It was not even, uh, you know, sort of in a da dangerous situation. But there was an object, but it was internal more. And, um, you know, began, when I began to see this, I was really struggling to get, you know, without knowing I was struggling because 
I hadn't really accepted this ment my mental state, which is also an emotional affect mind and body. And so when Achan Somedo once said, you know, those who are struggling with fear, um, you know, keep recreating it. That really the penny dropped, I can tell you. Wow, I keep recreating fear. I want to get rid of fear because if I did not know, if I, if I knew that fear goes, comes and goes, I wouldn't be so, you know, kind of um, so interested in finding a mean to get rid of it really quick. It's, I would never use these this words when this was happening. I knew enough of Buddhism not to get rid of anything, but yet the habit is still there. And until somebody, maybe, or a situation or a moment, the right moment comes, you suddenly know that, ah, I was, I didn't know that I was get, trying to get rid of it, but I was. And that is another piece of dukkha in our life. Not accepting things as they are. Not seeing things as they are, not accepting them as they are. Because when you accept things as they are, it's not like you are agreeing with what's going on. It's not like you are uh, judging in any way, positively or negatively. It's more you give yourself a chance to see them clearly. You know, If I want to see the palm of my hand and I keep doing that with it, I can't see it very clearly. But when I stop and I look, then I can see the palm of my hands and its lines. Yeah? And that's what it means to see just as things as they are. Maybe not underneath the skin, you know. I can't know what's going on maybe under the skin, clearly. But on the skin, I can see what's, what's happening. Yeah? If I have a little spider, I wouldn't know it. On the skin. So... You know, you, you have to realize that um, what the Buddha brought in his teaching is an incredible um, teaching of letting go of suffering. And our life is suffering until we understand this suffering. That's the first step to understand suffering. Number one, plan A, understanding what is this human suffering? Because, you know, suffering comes together with happiness. You know, we suffer a little bit and are happy. We always navigate from one to the other. We used to have a cat in Devon, a little monastery I spent a year, and suddenly I saw her. Every time she was disturbed or annoyed with something, she would immediately rush to a little plate of food. And I said, ah, she, really, she looks like me. Do you know how we do it in small things? It doesn't have to be a big thing. As soon as you, you know, you can, I mean, I don't have this, this kind of dynamic going on such a level, but as soon as you can see your mind, as soon as it is dissatisfied, it's looking for satisfaction in whatever form or shape it takes. You have one moment of dissatisfaction, immediately the mind is, is moving on to find satisfaction. And you can... Observe it yourself in your own mind when you meditate or in daily life. It's even more acute, more easy to see. You know? Somebody gives you bad news, up you go to the fridge and have something to eat or drink, you know, phone a friend, plan a holiday, whatever it is. You, you have, we have a great ability to do that. The mind just, it's, it's the normal, you could say, um, you, you, you know, program. I'm unhappy, I look for something happy. It's normal. If we haven't found any, any, any other things to help us, that's probably where we survive because we have enough moment of happiness to replenish ourselves with positive energy. Do you understand? Even if it's going to kill us. People do that with drugs. They do that with sex. They do that with all kinds of things. Even if it's going to kill them or you know, drag, drag them into a horrible kind of um, addiction drug or alcohol or whatever, it's still better than suffering without anything. So the Buddha says there is another way, you know. It's not the only way, but that's his way. <laughs> yeah? And the way was understanding suffering. And that is such a mature path in a way. How many human beings in this life want to understand the suffering they experience, the dissatisfaction they experience, 
the cause of this dissatisfaction, the whys and the how and, and the way eventually that leads this dissatisfaction out of my world, out of my mind. How many of us want to do that? Not so many. It's hard work. That's why. One thing is, it is hard work. You have to be quite focused, you know, on this particular theme to get to the point of insight, to get to the point of seeing clearly and knowing when you let go, when things have gone. But it is possible. This is why it's so amazing. It is actually workable. Not only workable, it works. <laughs> Full stop, you know. But so now we have the, you know, the suffering of the past. So the third, you know, I've talked to you about the first noble truth being dukkha. Okay, the second, the cause of dukkha. And the cause is about, is desire. So people say, oh, desire, you know, what do you mean? I can't have any desire in my life. No, 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 no. <laughs> You're encouraged simply to use the desire energy to be a supportive force for your path of liberation. That's the difference. The desire energy, you can't really kill it so easily. You know, it becomes more, um, you know, it doesn't direct your life in the way it does when the mind is untrained after you have understood the energy of desire. So the desire for sense pleasure. Who doesn't have desire for sense pleasure? Isn't it human? Isn't it absolutely normal in the human world, the desire for things that's pleasant? Whether it's a, you know, a beautiful place, a beautiful country, a beautiful food, a beautiful handsome man, women, a beautiful child, a beautiful mind, whatever it is, you know, the thing looking for pleasure, sense pleasure, whether it's music or painting or food or, uh, you know, intellectual um, knowledge and, and, and activity and satisfaction at the intellectual level and so on, you know. So we look for that, yeah? That's a cause of suffering. I, I saw it. <laughs> It's, it because what I saw is that desire is bottom. It has it's like a bottomless pit. It never ever ends. It seems until you stop feeding it. But you don't feed it by cutting it. You feed it because you understand the suffering of your desires, and nobody can tell you which one is suffering for you or for me. We all have different world, different needs different past, different story. What will drive me to crave for something might not drive anybody else, right? You've never seen a beach in your life, you never crave for a beach and sunshine and a nice sea to jump in, do you? If you live, I don't know, I mean, how many people, people travel so much these days, probably it's, it's a bad example, isn't it? <laughs> But whatever pleasure we're seeking, it's the one that we remember somehow. We have a memory that this particular thing has made us happy. And we want to recreate it again and again and again, whatever it is. We forget, of course, the dukkha of it. You know? Made us happy for a while and then miserable for a long, long time. But that we forget. The mind has a way of surviving, you know, with positive energy, which is not necessarily skillful, you know, not necessarily healthy. So then the, the second desire is a desire uh, for becoming. And the third, the desire for not become. Now, I, you know, I remember Ajahn Sumedho mentioning very simply, some words, uh, in a way that everybody could understand. I was going to say even your pet, if it was really tuned in with your heart, <laughs> could understand. You know, it's like um, wanting to become, you, you want to keep things going. You want to keep things. You want to become the pleasure you experience and you continue. And that, because you can't, then you start suffering. That's a simple, ordinary suffering of our daily life. And it happens all the time. Whether you even want it or not, whether you've even been so well trained, 
you know, I know I have a cup of coffee or something, and I may, uh, you know, once a day, and I say, oh, now that. But now I kind of I'm better. I do it for my body actually, for my own health. No, not one, not two, one. You know, but if I, my body was not telling me this, maybe I have more, more the pleasure of this, the pleasure of that, whatever pleasure we have in our life. Even meditation for a long time is a pleasure. I remember. I loved meditating sitting, you know. And so you want, you get into meditation like with a passion and a, and a force, you know, really. You want more meditation, more sitting, more retreat, more this, more that, even though I didn't quite believe that, you know. But the passion does it itself, you know, that kind of, you know, addiction almost to the pleasure of just sitting on the floor or, or you can also have a passion against meditation, which I did for a long, long time myself before I became a nun. I thought meditation for just for, for, was for kind of people, maladjusted people, you know, dropouts, you know, people that just can, can cope with life, which many monks and nuns have been accused of over the years. You know, they're probably in a monastery because they can't do anything else, you know. Might be true, I've never thinking about it, so why not, you know? But then, you, you will never want to swap what's got the teaching and the learning, for me, that's going on in this place here, for anything else. Because that's, if that brought me to this place, great, you know, to find to the point where the world is not, you know, doesn't give you the satisfaction you, you were looking for in life. Which is not just getting what I want, but also a sense of meaning or a sense of... Uh, uh, doing the good, we don't have these words in our language, in ordinary parlance, you know. But something that makes me feel happy, something that makes me feel my heart really happy. And uh, you know, when you look for for that in society, it's not always clear what is going to make you happy. So, just to stay with this truth, um, you know, the wanting not to become so it's e easier sometimes. You know, when you um, you see it all day long. It's manifesting in the mind. Becomes and not become. Becomes and not become. Every time your mind says, no, I don't want to do this, it's like you don't want to become what is being asked from you. For whatever good reason. You may have very good reason. It might be a wise reason. Okay? Somebody offers you something. You know it's poisonous. You don't want to be there. Right? But the desire to become, as somebody used to say, it's like, you know, people... Uh, don't want to become, don't want to carry on living, for example. You know, they just stay in bed, and don't want to know anymore. They're just depressed. They're just down and depressed and miserable. And they don't want to see the next day. They don't want to continue life momentum. You understand? And that is not happening in a special person. It's in the midst of your mind experience on a daily basis. You know? You do something and you get fed up with it. You know? You don't want to carry on, even though it's a good thing. You know? You're happy, or you see somebody happy. I've noticed that also. You, you see somebody happy, you, you feel happy for a while, and the person that continues to be happy, and you just get fed up with them looking happy. <laughs> you don't want to become what this person is, is feeling. The person is feeling happy, maybe, and uh, her happiness carries on. But you finished with it. You don't want to be more happy. Even as a good Buddhist, you just want to be more happy. That's enough. I want my grumpy face now. I just want to be me, myself. So I was saying to one of the sisters, you know, when she was mentioning about one members of a, of a, you know, situation where she was going, that uh, this one person was grumpy. I said, I know this person. So I said, just tell this person to be totally, you know, uh, receiving the grumpiness that this person feels with great love and brightness. Because that's what we do a lot of the time. We refuse life. It doesn't work for me. I don't want it. And we think we're going to let it go like that. But we don't. It might be superficially letting go. We distract ourselves for a little while. Aversion can do a good job. You know, aversion. You know, I'm, I don't want this. I hate that, etc. That can do a bit of a work. 
But the work of wisdom and liberation doesn't take that route. The route of liberation is actually to learn how to see that what you experience through your meditation practice, you begin to see the unsubstantiality, the unreality, the un, you know, the unreality, unsubstantiality, you know, of your experience. Our experiences are so deep and heavy and substantial as long as we cling to them. You stop clinging to them, you say, why did I get so upset about this? It's like a little kind of cloud going to my mind. I say, why did I get so heavy and upset? It means nothing to me. I've been forgotten. Some, something that seemed to be urgently, urgently important. That's what we have to learn, to wait. <laughs> this is a teaching for myself too, to wait and not jump on things straight away. So you have the cause of suffering, desire for sense pleasure, desire to become, desire not to become. How many of us want to become old? Tell me. Have you been jumping of joy as you're becoming old? No. Huh? Yet we have to receive old age with joy, you know, with great peace and a bright mind. <laughs> That's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> well, so meditation will take you there. And the understanding that you can't do anything else anyway. So you stop fighting. And you just rejoice in the fact you're still alive for another day. It's great, isn't it? Just one more day. Pretty good, isn't it? I can still hear. You know, most of us can hear. You can see. You can walk still. Uh, it's a way of training the mind towards peace. It's not, you know... It's a good brainwashing, you could see, but brainwashing means you're just, um, you know, obsessing yourself in a very unskillful way. This is just reminding the mind of the reality, the truth of this life. You can't go back and be a baby again, even though I don't think anybody will want to become a baby again, do we? Do we? With all the work you had to do and how many times you had to be changed and how many times you peed and pooed and all that sort of thing. Gosh, you know, you don't want to become a teenager. It's one of the things, I don't want to be reborn, just I don't want to be a teenager again, even though it wasn't that bad, really. I got good parents. But still, the sort of struggling to find the meaning of life at the age of 16 or 17, or it probably starts earlier these days, you know, to find why I'm here. And you have nothing to help you except, you know, loud music, you know, frantic friends around and... Uh, you know, parents worried all the time about what you're going to do in your life. So we're surrounded from all sides by a, a world of dissatisfaction. If it is not you, it's others who are dissatisfied about you, and you catch the 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 the, the bug, okay. And then, <clears throat> then you have the cessation of suffering which is the third noble truth. That's the end of dukkha. That's when the mind expands. You know, it's not like contracted. And you start, the mind is free, more free, more free. Yeah? And then the th fourth noble truth is the noble eightfold path. That's a kind of, a, you could say, the course. Course in liberation. Your eight path, eightfold path is a, you know, a, a life course in liberation. Yeah, you have philosophy course, you have liberation course as well. So this is a noble eightfold path. And this noble eightfold path is made up of eight aspects. You have, which can be sometimes summarized in three, sila, samadhi, panya. Sila means ethic, samadhi means meditation, panya means wisdom. But when you read it in books, it's actually presented as panya, sila, and samadhi. Okay? Developing right view, knowing, for example, that those four noble truths exist, 
as long as we don't understand the first noble truth, we still be prisoners of the suffering. The second has to be let go of the cause of suffering. Our work through meditation, through the Noble Eightfold Path, is to um, let go of suffering, abandon suffering. Then the third uh, noble truth, okay, Niroda. So the first one is Dukkha, second one is Samudaya, the third one is Niroda. And Niroda means cessation. Sometimes it's a word that can be, uh, that, that is used for Nibbana. So it's a taste of Nibbana, if you're really interested in Nibbana. Liberation from greed, hatred, and delusion. It's a mega project. It's, um, you know, which can take, which takes place in the here and now, at each moment. You don't have to wait 20 years. You need to start now to be able to realize this truth. And um, the fourth, the, um, let's say, the, the three aspects of the path, it's something that you need to really get interested in. If you're not interested, you know, who wants to keep the five precepts, for example, the sila? Even though the Buddha said, if you can't keep the five precepts, you're not fully human. You don't have to believe him. In fact, he does, the Buddha doesn't want us to believe him. That's one of the thing that the Westerners love because they don't want to believe in anything anymore and they want to think for themselves. That's why I think Buddhism is so popular these days because it has this dimension of exploration and investigation by oneself, to realize by oneself. And so uh, when we uh, come you know, to the, uh, the past itself, there's still dukkha. Why, what is the dukkha of the past? Right? What is the dukkha of the past? The dukkha of the past <laughs> is seeing your mind and letting it go. Most of us, we have so many convictions, opinions, and views about how our mind should be, what we should do, what we should think, what we should, how we should act. We don't have a lot of space and time to actually see the mind as it is, even though that can happen in any situation at any time of day and night, you can see the mind as it is. But you need also the capacity to be so patient with the suffering aspect of your mind. Do you understand? People are addicted to happiness because it, it's really lovely to witness happiness in oneself, isn't it? Wonderful to experience happiness and to see our heart and mind and body happy. It's great, isn't it? Why well, we will not want that? The actual passive liberation has another aspect. It's going through the shadow part. I mean, what we call in you know, modern psychology, the shadow part. The part that we don't like, usually. That's why we call it shadow. But they're still active in everyday life, as much as our happiness. But we call it shadow. It's the kind of thing we don't want to see. We don't want to see ourselves as an angry person, or a greedy person, or a jealous person, or an envious person, or a, you know, or, or, or. You can fill up the gaps yourself. How many, how many of us want to look so undignified as what we think about ourselves, you know? What happened in practice in a monastery, it's a good place, because at some point you really don't care what other people think anymore. What I mean by this is that your, your sense of... Um, uh, you know, of, of how you look and how you should look, your, all the personas that we carry around about having to satisfy other people's needs or our, you know, boss needs. I mean, sometimes we're serious, not just any old body. Or even our partner needs, you know, or our children. So very often, you know, we have to kind of uh, uh, create ourselves into somebody we don't want to be. But when, I, I, when you can see jealousy in yourself, I remember I never wanted to see jealousy. I felt so embarrassed to, to have anybody seeing me jealous. Ask any woman, you're jealous. Oh, no, of course not. No, no, no. She's fine. I always wanted that for her to go away with my partner. 
I didn't have any problem with that. Sure, just check double, d double check. <laughs> Do you know, it's like we, we have a bit of a shame about admitting that we are, you know, not perfect. We, are, we might know it ourselves, but we are ashamed of it. You have a big, terrible feeling related to the imperfect, imperfect mind. We feel embarrassed, we feel ashamed, we feel a kind of, you know, angry with it, all kinds of things. Basically, we haven't found peace with ourselves. <laughs> That's the bottom line, is that we haven't found peace with this imperfect body and mind. There's nothing wrong with that, but the past is leading you to this goal of leaving behind the greed, hatred, and delusion, and finding the peace of Niroda, cessation, Nibbana. And people think that Nibbana is some state, you know, I'll be with the saints, with the heavenly beings up there, playing harps, and sort of lying on a beach, a divine beach somewhere, who knows? with lots of wonderful people around me, and so on. No, Nibbana is not so interesting, actually. It's just nobody can... What I mean by this is human beings are not really that interested in something. They have no idea what ha what's going to happen. Who knows? Who has come back and say, oh, I'm, I'm an, in, you know, an arahant, free from greed, hatred, and delusion. And you say, what, what does it feel like? Nothing much. Maybe. I'm not talking about myself, by the way. You know, the, the path that leads you to arahantship, the peace of freedom from greed, hatred, and delusion, is just this quality of you have to realize for yourself. And you can get a taste of it when you realize that in, the ground, in this ground of peacefulness, there is an enormous, extraordinary potential for living with wisdom, compassion, peacefulness, patience, generosity, kindness, because the peace that you experience is the ending of me, I. This I is that little thing in the middle that holds your whole world of suffering in place. Do you understand? It's holding it in place. That's why it's so difficult to let go. Because every time you let go a little, you let go of your attachment to self, to me, mine. It's not easy to understand. I've given up on understanding myself because you can always make a lot of stories about these things. Because really, what I find much more, um, you know, interesting on the past is to know when I suffer, I know how to deal with it. Now, do you understand? It's like you don't have to become suffering and make yourself sick over years and years of not handling your suffering. You can actually walk the path of health on the mental level and the physical level. And so this you can be sure, you, might, you will die for sure, you know, and not in the best condition. Sometimes, you know, when my mind was complaining about my practice and this and that, I used to kind of remind it and say, well, you know, Sundara, when you die, you might not be in the best conditions. Remember that? So, just get on with it. <laughs> get on with cultivating the heart and transforming it into a beautiful, beautiful uh, place that brings into the world also this the, the same qualities yeah. So it's not that you're going to change forever or anything like that. A person is not going to change that much. It'd be difficult to change me being from France into an English lady. And I'm not that interested anyway. <laughs> as well, you need interest to change as well. <laughs> it's one of the, the Dipada I talked about for some of you who were there in one of my last talk. You know, you have to have a great interest, energy, and a, a mind focused on things. And the, the third aspect was 
exploration and questioning to be able to transform the mind, you know. But your personality, you can let, let it, you can let it die. It's fine. I always think that personally they purify through Dharma is so much more beautiful. It's not as glamorous, maybe, you know. It's not as scintillating and attractive to the world. But it makes a big difference <laughs> in terms of peace and happiness and the sense of confidence and the sense of um, you know, in all aspects of our life. This is just wonderful path, really. And I encourage you, all of you, to not forget it in your daily life. Because even in the monastery, you know, and we have many reminders, fortunately, but the mind has a capacity to forget things which is as bottomless as desire. That's my experience of desire. You know, there's no end to it. Except when you start begin, you know, looking and investigating and understanding. Before I finish, I just wanted to uh, put, a, uh, you know, the end of suffering. The last part is really about, I already spoke about this, I don't need to go again over it. But... Um, when you practice, you know, you may feel, oh, I'm not going anywhere, I'm not, you know, making any progress or anything like that. When you hear this kind of voice in your mind, learn to listen to your mind rather than believing your mind, which we do all the time, don't we? Suddenly, uh, you, your mind is saying something, particularly for the things that are negative. You hear something, and I'm a hopeless case, I will never make it. And then if you believe it, and it's already gone into your heart, your cells, your body, and the whole, the whole system is, you know, has, it has infiltrated through your whole system. You come out of Amorwati totally hopeless. Okay? But if you suddenly hear your mind say, I'm a hopeless case, I'll never get it. So me, me not practicing, I say, I hear you. And I go back to being here and now. I hear you, and sometimes it's an information. Maybe I have to put a bit more energy. It doesn't mean I dis, I dis, uh, how can I, say? I, I disregard what's being said in my mind, but I just listen to it as an information center. Okay, but I don't have to make it mine and me. Do you understand? I don't have to take it on board and transform myself into this message which will happen very quickly. You know, one famous uh, scientist, uh, Deepak Chopra, I don't know if some of you know him, made an, exp you know, an experiment. He said, you just have to think, I'm thirsty for all the cell to hold the uh, water. Goes quick, you know, between the brain and the body. Goes very fast. Message. Don't need, don't, don't. Don't need a, a very a time, almost. It just happened instant, instantly. So, what are you going to put in your mind from, your, from today onward to make sure that all your physical body is well nourished, has a good diet? Everybody is talking about diet for the body, diet for this, for that. Buddhism is a good diet for the mind, not just your brain, but also your feelings, your emotions, your thoughts, your, um, you know, your senses and all that. Good food for the heart and mind. On this word, I stop then. Okay. Now we have about 15 minutes break for a tea, little tea uh, break. And then uh, another hour, if you wish to stay, another hour for question and answer sessions. So please, you're very welcome to come back. And I'm very happy to sit with you. Okay. So, do you have any kind of burning questions? Or just ordinary questions? Whatever question you have. Yeah.
No? Oh, well, we can stop and go home. <laughs> Don't wait for the person next to you to ask your questions because that can happen. Surely somebody is going to ask a question that I really want to ask but don't dare. Well, it's quite safe here. Yeah? You can ask any question you want. So you've gone beyond doubt, huh? Great. Okay, so... Young, young. Oh, we need a, we need lots of sound. Hello. Can you talk a bit more about suffering? Now you're talking to somebody who is. <coughs> yeah. Please make sure I hear well. I'm normally very loud. Sorry. <laughs> um, just wanted to know a bit more about suffering and when you physically feel pain in your stomach, for example, or in your throat, how you cope with that pain, how you've coped with that suffering to get where you are now? <clears throat> well, when you have physical pain, there's sometimes there's not much you can do except to maybe use a painkiller. It's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so you've got the option for painkillers, um, but the other option in terms of Dharma practice, because I have had you know chronic pain myself before I had my two hip joints replaced, so arthritis, you know. And so um, now I'm painless, but I used it, I, because, I were, because I'm non-practicing the Dharma, I made sure that I was not going to waste this opportunity to see mind and body, you know, to, know, to see how they work. And what I notice, even though I may not be able to change unless I take a painkiller, I may not be able to change the pain in my physical body, but I can work with the mind because what the mind does, it's, you know, the mind is always reactive to pain. So it's your emotions, your feeling, your bodily sensation, your memory about pain and so on, you know. So the mind starts reacting to pain big time, you know. And the message is mostly don't want, out, go, resistance, aversion, negativity, impatience, the lot, with pain. So what you do is that... You you know, if you're really interested in the Dhamma, you know that the mind can actually change and come to a place of peace. The body may not change, but the mind does. And then when you practice with the mind in this way, you realize eventually how much the pain has decreased by the fact that you're taking care of the reactivity of the mind to the pain, suddenly half of the pain is gone. Someday even the whole pain is gone. You know, we may have pain in the body, so body that's sensitive and that's react with pain and so on, or the body deteriorate and so on. So <clears throat> body is more difficult to, um, you know, eradicate pain on a physical level, but on the mental, emotional, you know, uh, level, it's quite possible to decrease this amount of uh, activity of the mind. So that's very wonderful. I've, I've actually practiced it myself for many years because you say you don't want to waste your time. You know, you don't want to waste your time with pain that decripples you or that makes you feel terrible, you know, that... All that, all that which comes together with a painful body, the aging process, you know, once upon a time you could do anything and at some point you get more very limited in your movements or very, you know, swamped with perceptions, your negative perception, you know, I will never be able to do this and that and so on. You know, so all these things is mind, our mind. Do you understand? 
So you can work with that and occasionally take, maybe take a painkiller to kind of relieve the body as well and, and the brain. Because the brain has a way of, you know, a, a kind of processing pain. You know, it's like, it's like a habit sometimes. You know, you have to be very careful. Mind and body are so interact, interact, you know, interact with each other and to intertwine, you know, that it's, you know, you just have one miserable, the body starts doing its own thing or, the, or vice versa. Is that satisfactory? Thank you. Okay. Don't be shy. It's all right. We've heard everything here. Don't worry. You're curious. Somebody there? Oh, this lady is here. Um, I have a question. When there is this feeling of peace after letting go. Um, in what way? Because the Buddha said, like, even neutral feeling is is dukkha. So, in what way is like feeling at peace? Can you feel a difference between that and a neutral feeling, like not being in it? Because you mean I, neutral I, feeling or painful feeling, the difference. Uh, sorry. Come a little closer. Come a little closer, because I, I didn't get every word you said. Maybe in the second one. <laughs> like today we were chanting um, one of the, the sutta texts where it's like about emotion, like positive, neutral, and uh, Oh, the feeling, unpleasant. neutral, yeah, pleasant, unpleasant, yeah. neutral, yes. And that they're all also dukkha. And I, I was wondering, um, this peacefulness after letting go, in what way can it maybe also be... Um, Pleasant. <laughs> a neutral feeling that I maybe don't recognize because it's neutral, because it feels at peace, so mm. I kind of identify with a neutral thing, mm. although it's um, not seizing. So how can you recognize a neutral feeling? That's my question. <laughs> mm. yeah. Well, and, and, you know, often we talked about neutral feeling as something which is in once on being known. Do you understand? Mm. It's, one, it's in wants, it's lacking, not being known. So, um, you know, there's many things that you don't know about yourself yet. You don't worry too much about it, do you? So because you read this on a piece of paper, you say, oh dear, not neutral feeling. What do I do with that? What are they? I won't worry too much, you know. Let them come up in your mind, so eventually at some point you know them. Yeah? Okay, thank you. I just wanted to ask, um, you were talking earlier about the dukkha and the connection with the inability that we have got to see things as they really are. Mm -hmm. What can we cultivate within ourselves? Or what can we do to be able to get closer to seeing things as they really are? It's so simple that we don't get it. That's a problem. You know, things as they are is kind of you know, things as they are. There are four words, you know. To express uh, something simple like when you're angry, you know you're angry. When you're cold, you know you're cold. When you're tired, you know you're tired. When you're miffed, you know you're miffed. When you're happy, you know you're happy. Things as they are right now. And you don't have to dig into something that's not present, you know, that you can't see. Just what you see is, I mean, I, had, I didn't speak much actually in my talk, but it's, what you see is things that they are, that they are changing, they are unsatisfactory, they are painful, and they are not mine, not me, not mine. From the Buddhist perspective, that's what you have to look at, you know. But you can see it when you actually see something. You can, you can actually notice it when you see it. 
You know, so when you see, for example, a pain in your body, it might be pleasant or unpleasant, but you also, you know, it change, changes. So when it's pleasant, you will notice maybe the mind wanting to prolong it. When it's unpleasant, the mind goes into vibhavatanha, the second, the desire of the second, you know, the, 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 the way the second, the cause of suffering is expressed, you know, like not wanting, not wanting to, you know, to become this painful feeling or wanting to, you know, continue and perpetuate that pleasant feeling. So, um, seeing things as they are is that you can take it from the point of view of anicca, dukkha, anatta, okay? But also, what I like about the Buddhist teaching is the simplicity of knowing when you are, uh, you know, upset about something, you just know clearly you're upset. You don't pretend. You know, the, the mind has a capacity to hide itself, you know, to pretend that something else is happening, Especially in kind of social gathering, or you know, where you you are it's kind of conditioned to look good, to look presentable, to look sort of um, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. It does. Thank you. Hello. You have the microphone. Somebody is with me. Yeah. yeah. Maybe because uh, um, Yung Kyung is looking after the the video, you can just pass it around amongst yourself. Huh? How do you get a right understanding about right the understanding, understanding about anything about teaching and the skillful to dealing with the... About the teaching, what was the other thing? And skillful dealing with things. Skillful. Sk what is skillful? Mm. <clears throat> Good question. You know, um, <clears throat> for a long time, we don't really know what is skillful or unskillful, even though that we can... Uh, we, we tend to go towards things that makes us happy. You notice that. A sense of self-respect, a sense of dig, you know, a dignified feeling about us, you know. We, we, something that makes us feel good. And we don't know yet, maybe. So it's like discovering little by little what brings uh, happiness in ourselves. So right understanding, it's a, it's a kind of large you know, words for what it actually means. Right understanding is part of the uh, Noble Eightfold Path, the first link on the Noble Eightfold Path, right? Right view, which includes right understanding as well. So for example, uh, right view <coughs> talks about, you know, is included in right view the Four Noble Truths, that what is happening is not me and not mine, is fundamentally unsatisfactory, and it's um, tr transient. Now, when you say this to yourself, it's like giving yourself a, a medicine, a little portion of Dharma, right? It's reminding your mind that you don't need to attach to these things. It's like really dealing with attachment, identification, and grasping and clinging. You remind yourself, have enough people here, here seen that clinging and grasping to things is happy and lead to more happiness? Has anybody seen a grasping and clinging that brings an increase of happiness? Anybody? No? No, you've seen too many things, I can see. So you can see that most of us here in this room are committed 
to not follow the path of clinging and grasping, aren't we? Yeah? Hmm? So, that's a basic, like a fundamental kind of, like a foundation. Okay? So, um, you notice that your right understanding is, ouch, it hurts, you know? It's like, oh yeah, what am I, what am I hanging on to right now? Sometimes it's not very clear what we are clinging to. It might be buried under all kinds of false reasons. What am I clinging to? What am I identifying to? So the f first noble truth is helpful because it's like really the symptom, the first symptom of grasping. I mean, the first obvious symptom of grasping, because there's a lot of years of grasping that don't, we haven't seen any symptoms of it yet. Do you know what I mean? Don't, we don't know we are clinging to things. Right? We don't know we are clinging to health until we get the dukkha of being unhealthy. And then the misery and the pain and the agonizing feeling that we have when we become sick. We don't know we're grasping to youth until we're becoming older and feel utterly dejected by the process of aging. Yeah? And we don't know we are, um, you know, <laughs> we are mortal <laughs> until we are just about to pass our last breath sometimes. It takes a long time to think that, to think correctly that I am mortal. And I could die tomorrow, I don't know. Which brings the theme of death, which I think is a very, very, you know, vital reflection we should do every day. I am of the nature to die. I don't know when I will, that will come. But when you bring this topic into your mind, you find that a sense of urgency rises up with it. Unless you are completely overwhelmed by fear and anxiety and worry. The other side is that a sense of urgency comes, yes. How, who, how do I know I'm going to last one more night? You know? We don't know. Right? And so that's very important to understand that. For example, the suffering of not knowing that we identified with things, you know. And we just suffer, we don't know. So right understanding is when you suffer now and you know the Buddhist teaching, you say, oh, this is dukkha, okay. Oh, the Buddha says it's not mine. You don't know yet what it means, maybe. Don't think about it, just go with the, you know, the experience of it. Just go with the experience, directly, direct, immediate knowledge on the job. Don't get a book in between, even all your Buddhist, uh, you know, baggage that some of you have. You know, when you are born into a Buddhist country sometimes, you have a lot of baggage, of Buddhist baggage. So you have to be a bit careful with that, because sometimes they, they become more important than the reality of now. Do you understand? And yet it is in the now that you can see things clearly. Thinking, reflecting, you know, conceptualizing, uh, letting the mind churn around ideas and so on is very good too to, for clarification. If you're stuck with a lot of views and opinions and ideas about some certain things, it's always good to reflect whether these ideas, these views and opinions are actually correct and in accord with reality. Otherwise, you're still living with some, you know, inaccurate information, which are past, what do you call it? Passed by date. <laughs> you know? They're finished. They're redundant. So in right understanding is knowing anicca dukkha anatta, clearly, directly, 
Right understanding is knowing that we're going to die one day. We don't need to make a big fuss about this day. It could be our last day. You don't know. And it's like giving food to the mind to let go, to, to drop its kind of baggage that come from believing that tomorrow I'll be alive. Or in a year time sometime, you know. Let's not say tomorrow, maybe a year time. So suddenly when you bring truth and reality to the mind, it, it can actually shed things without you even doing anything. and experience the peace of letting go. Do you know, the mind is subtle. We don't see it, we don't know it, we don't know where it begins and ends. We, don't, we think it's in our body, it's not in our body particularly. And the mind is what drives us all the time. One word of kindness makes you feel wonderful and great. Somebody say, oh, you're the most wonderful person in my life. Oh. How many people will hate that? Not many. It depends who says it, I suppose. If we're attached. <laughs> but, you know, the mind is terribly influenceable. So this is why we need to have a right understanding over it. You know, the mind is made up of, you know, feeling, thinking, perception, and then sense doors, and then sense consciousness. So that's con you know, understanding correctly when you can see. I find the, the, the description of the mind by the Buddha is incredibly helpful. Why is it helpful? It's because you can realize for yourself what he's talking about. You don't have to look for something really bizarre and strange and airy-fairy and you know, transcendent, but nobody knows what you're talking about, you know. So right understanding is to know that also that um, you know that when you know that your thoughts are really empty it's quite extraordinary you know to know that you are being so bogged down by life we thought that when looked into deeply do not exist I mean they are no substance to them they just pass and come and go and come and go it's like being on a Screen film, you know, the, 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 f the screen on which you, you're shooting a, a, a film on it. You make it really quick, you know, and it looks, oh, wow, look at that, look at that, and Henry's there, and Jenny's there, blah, blah, blah. You slow it down, it's just shadows, black and white, gray. You slow it down, so that's what meditation does. It slows down our personal film, life, life saga film. Slow it down, slow it down. Suddenly, oh, what do you? I feel so good now. For a week I've been on retreat, not kind of rewinding my life movie. That's why people love retreat, because for a little while they just slow it down. And then the story disappeared, and then the yesterday, tomorrow disappear. You're held by the nice monks and nuns of Amarawati teaching and so on, and a wonderful kitchen at Amarawati, and people supporting Amarawati and so on. And suddenly, you don't really have to carry your life story all the time, you know, especially when it is miserable. So, you realize that your mind is constructing things out of sometimes fluff, thin air, space, emptiness. What makes you ask this question? Just memories. Just coming back all the time. Oh God. Come Just memories always coming back. This question. And I can't stop it. Memories. Oh, the memories. Oh, God. So you wanted to know about memories, or is that part of the first question also? Yes. Yes. It's the same together, yeah. Well, memory is a very important topic, actually, yeah. Memory disappear. Do you want your memory to disappear at some point? Not seeing the one I can remember, whether it's you know, today or tomorrow. You mean memory from the past, yeah. Well, everybody has memory 
you know, that are haunting the mind and we can't let them go. Huh? You know that kind of memory. You know, the path doesn't have a lot of, um, you know, mysterious kind of uh, practice. It's all out in the open there. And memory, sometimes what you can do, to, just like with anything that is conceptual or visual in terms of images, but we can bring back our thoughts more easily than we can bring back images, you notice that. So with memory, uh, I worked with memory in a way, uh, in a way using a uh technique, you could say, teaching. Um, you know, they, they come, and when you are at peace with them, when the memory, you come into a, a mind that is peaceful, they're just thought and feeling and mood and images. Where's the person who asked his question? Oh, that's right. Sorry, I was still. Yeah, yeah. So, but in fact, I talk to everybody really, uh, because it's a question I think that is, um, you know, um, important for everyone. Yeah. So memory, you um, you bring it into your mind, and just like a, a construct, it's a construct like a sankara, or you know, you can just make peace with it, and you can observe how it will pass away. Now, when you observe something like this and you let it be, you do this process many times, as long as you want, and the actual energy of mindfulness awareness is stopping the fuel for this memory to come back. Do you understand? This memory is fueled by certain things. First of all, by your attachment to it. They come back because you still have karma with them. Do you understand? You still want them or don't want them. Either one or the other. You want this memory to come back consciously or unconsciously, or you don't want them to return. And that creates aversion, and that keeps them coming back whether it's through love of this memory or aversion towards that memory, that, what's, that is what brings them back. Is that clear? So they will pass. They will pass. But what is passing, in my, in my mind, is not so much... You can still remember things, but the pain, the dukkha is gone. Do you understand? It's been, you could say, purified, quote unquote. You know, it has lost its the 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 quality of being dukkha. Memory is just a, a story, an image, but it's okay. You are, you are. It's not like you have changed the memory into something nice. You just realize you are at peace with it, and it's not a problem. It's just a memory. But very often, the memory is painful. It's, it's um, compounded with painful feeling. It's compounded with hurt, with, uh, you know, the, the unknown hurt, you know, with uh, taking risk or frightened to taking risk, you know, that, all kind of, you know, self-interest. Okay, any other question about this? So seeing things as they are, to go back to link the two with what the other question is, maybe you may think, I'm actually with this person because I need this person materially. Okay. Okay? So you can say something like that. And then you make peace. Do you understand? At some point, you can beat yourself up because you feel it's not noble. You can make the other person awful enough to think that he still needs you or she needs you. <laughs> she don't go because you have find a good cause in your uh, you know, relationship with that person. You can't go away because they need you. Or I can go away because I need them. So this kind of uh, a game that can carry on in ourselves and we feel sometimes ashamed of it or embarrassed or frightened by this 
you know, this kind of statement. But when we make peace with that level, you realize there is a deeper level. As you make peace with this level, you go down a deeper level, and you make peace with that level, and other people, other things rise. Then you make peace with that level, and eventually it's gone. So things don't go maybe straight away in one shot. That's why the Buddha said, patience and endurance are the highest austerities. He never said, if you sit on the bed of Nell for 40 days and stop eating for three months and sleep with the eyes open and all that kind of thing, you'll be enlightened. No, just patience and endurance. Is what, it is what it takes to be able to witness a very unsatisfactory mind called me, that I call myself. Do you understand? It takes that amount of patience and loving kindness in oneself to receive your life as it is, rather than as we thought it was, or as, how it should be, or as, you know, I would hope it to be. So, you need to... It takes a lot of honesty. It's a lot of integrity. But if you don't lose the goal in mind, then it's much easier. Because then you have more momentum going for it, you know. Once you've seen for experience, through experience, that cause and effect you know, into things, the process of cause and effect. When I do this, I feel better. And you say, why? You know, it's like an exploratory uh, map, the meditation practice and the, and the Buddhist path. It's so lovely. It really, you, you are totally involved at the center of your life. The Buddha didn't say just like, believe me, it's true, the only way, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not particularly quoting anything. I'm not referring to any particular religion. Don't get me wrong, but... Um, you know, it's just like giving you the confidence that you can know for yourself. You're not, de you're not dependent on a guru or dependent on what somebody say. You're not dependent because it is a tradition. You're not dependent on knowing the truth because it's what the elders of this community have said all the time or because it's, you know, logically uh, reasonable or philosophically sensible, and so on, you know? But through direct experience, and the Buddha is always returning to what is, you know, right understanding is really understanding what is skillful and what is unskillful. Now, these are kind of cover vast area of our life before we understand that, because skillful and unskillful are dependent on so many things. So you need also the development of wisdom that can see and know a situation in, you know, at a deeper level and at a broader level as well. You need to know people, you need to know yourself, you need to know how to, you know, to reflect on the effect of your actions or you reflect on your speech. So it takes a lot more than just a few words can explain, you know. Make sense? Or you're falling asleep? <laughs> or you're tired. Almost going to ask a question there. Almost. No? Yes. Mine is not a question. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. I think it's on. No? Unless your voice is... Good voice. <laughs> okay. It's just that this thank you for your question because it's been a question in my head for a long time. And I think I have 2% right view and I think I spend that 2% right view somehow in regretting. I'm 53, I keep thinking so much life I threw away because I haven't been skillful or I didn't know. How to be skillful. Mm -hmm. So just, just that, really. 
That's right. But now you know, so you have no excuse, do you? No. <laughs> to yourself or, or towards others, yeah. 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 That's right. A yeah, sense of urgency. We have to find what makes it strange, because sometimes when you do things for a long time, even in a monastery, you know, you have to kind of motivate yourself. Because even though the goal is quite clear, you know, but life is not, not as clear as, uh, <laughs> as many, you know, as what you think sometimes, you know. So you have to keep starting again, starting again, and sometimes remembering why did you start on this path in the first place? You know, asking questions, what, what I'm here for? Or what, what do I do with my life? And then this question is not to get you stressed out and neurotic about finding out that you have no answer to this question, but simply to remember that uh, one aspect of the life is to remember, or the human life, is to remember to, you know, the, the aspect of contentment is very important. Contentment in Pali is santuti, and Italian, doesn't it? Tutti frutti. Yeah. Santuti. And it means, uh, it, it comes from santa, which means peace in, in Pali. Yeah. And contentment, it's such a beautiful feeling. And it's, you know, I, I go more and more as I practice, I realize you have a language of the heart. And you also have the feeling of the heart. Like the, f the ten parameters are the feeling and the words that the heart loves. You know, whether it's, even though we don't know yet, but when we practice, you can feel the heart happy when you are generous, ethical, kind, determined, wise, uh, equanimous, you know, the, the calm of equanimity, the, you know, these ten parameters, these are the qualities that the heart loves. And then the words, um, you know, also there's the words of the heart, like love, gratitude, contentment, um, forgiveness, uh, all the things that the brain can't stand, because the brain is all about discrimination and finding right and wrong and... I mean, brain, when I mean untrained brain, you know. Maybe it's not, it doesn't have the edge that the thinking brain like. Meta, loving, compassion. I don't know that because for me, even though, even though I didn't consider myself what you would call an intellectual, particularly, I didn't particularly want to be, but um, I remember when people didn't have the edge of thinking clearly and, you know, strongly about things. I was not one bit interested. Talk to me about, you know, contentment, peace, love, metta. It just went, you know, I can understand them, of course. I love being compassionate and so on. But they didn't have an active sense in terms of force. It didn't, didn't come through in the sense of something active. It seemed very passive, even though now I don't think like that at all. I think it's the most active force, actually, whether it's love and compassion or forgiveness and uh, faith, you know, faith, sada, took faith to the Westerners, you know, they've been up to here mad but having faith and not being able to think for themselves. Don't give me that faith again, you know. Let let it go. A long time ago, people would say, you know, or might say, they want to think for themselves. But now faith, it has a very different quality to me. When I go to Thailand, I see people have a huge amount of faith, and the Westerners can really look down sometimes on the fact that people can have terrific confidence in a teacher, in a teaching, without having to think like crazy about it. Do you understand? They just, they just know it works. It's like, they know cause and effect. They don't have to think about it. They know it. In the Buddhist countries, sometimes it's like that. So then the Buddhist people from the Buddhist country, from Sri Lanka or Thailand, maybe they will be start being critical about having too much faith and not enough wisdom, or having too much faith in things that uh, uh, maybe they should move on to, to to take a step further into their practice. 
But faith is one of the five faculties, you know, so it's not a small thing. Faculties, there are five faculties that inhabit this mind. It's a faculty, faculty, faculty of wisdom and faith, and then you have concentration and energy, and in the middle, balancing the, the two on each side, is mindfulness. So this faith is very important. And yet in our mind, for many people, it doesn't mean much, you know, even though we have faith, but we don't tap into it much, you know. So faith is what leaves the mind sometimes just not knowing, but at peace with it. And sometimes you come to a place of confidence because you've done all the work behind to come to that place of confidence. Like experience brings faith, brings confidence. You know, you know it. Once you know it, nobody is going to take that knowledge away from you because it's with you. You know, once you know that things are impermanent, no matter how many people may, even if the whole world caved on me and told me this is not impermanent, I say, well, good for you, you know. I wouldn't fight, but I know that things are changing all the time. And this is just one example amongst, you know, thousands of stories we could tell each other. But certainly if you want to have confidence in um, yourself, I'm not saying you have to experience everything, that would be too much. But you choose maybe something that is close to you and easy to work with, like to be confident in the fact you can be silent for one day. Take it at the right time, not at the weekend when you want to relax with your spouse or your children or your friends, you know. Do it at a time when you, maybe just a few hours, you know, it doesn't have to be a whole day. Maybe your chatterbox, chatterbox, you can't stop talking, people get really annoyed and so on, and you feel, oh God, I can't stop, you know. But then you stop for a few hours and that gives you the confidence, yes, I can. It's like I remember doing practice with sleep, sleeping less, sleeping, sitting up, and so on, you know. After that, yeah, I don't need to worry endlessly about whether I should sleep longer or shorter, da da da, you know, doubts. And at some point, I knew I could sleep in different ways and I didn't need so much sleep. That's how I find how much sleep roughly I will need each day without feeling either guilty or overindulging, you know, or maybe too, too demanding on my body the um, capacity, strength, you know. It would be damaging my health too much, you know, to the point where I can't practice. If only slept maybe two hours or a, n a night or something. Many teachers sleep very little per each night, you know. But it, each one of us have to find for ourselves what works, you know. So, if you have no more questions, we can probably adjourn. Adjourn. A journée, we say in French. So many words in French are like uh, are part of the English language. It's very easy for me to connect with those words. And uh, I wish you a very nice. Well, tomorrow is a week start again for so many of you, eh? for us too. And actually, I'm kind of partly on retreat. So you get me a time when I'm not engaged with too many things. So I'll be here for a few more minutes if you want to, you know, talk to me more personally or, yeah. So feel free. I'm very happy to um, help you if you have more questions or anything else.